And there we go. Welcome to episode 63 of Quarkus Insights. This time we're going to talk about Quarkus of Spring. Um, and for news, we don't actually have that much, but I do want to share one thing that we just put, put public today. And I just lost my link. Man, I had it just before. Yeah, if you go on this link I posted here, it's one of we have this user story uh, category on on the blogs, um, and uh, this time it was actually uh, uh, Loic, who's uh, contributed to Quarkus for a long time, who's been who suddenly showed up last week. Hey, I have this story for us, and you want on show? And I'm like, yes, let's do that. And then it turns out it's like this massive, really interesting uh, deployment they have at Decathlon, um, and you know. Well, I recommend to read it. They not only were they very high performance, but they also liked the developer experience. So it's like a double, <laughs> double thing. Um, double win for us. Double, double win for us. Yeah. But uh, anyway, so and there's a ton of other use stories. And if any of you guys who are listening out there are, are interested, you know, let me know, and uh, we go for it. Okay. Uh, let's see. Do we have to connect? Oh, it's starting up. Okay. So anyway. Um, Otherwise, we have two, two, three coming out this week. George's, when you're not not here, then you're working on the weekends. <laughs> um, yeah, and, yeah, it'll it'll it. be out later this week. But awesome. And then, uh, well, Eric, let, tell me who who are you and how do you get here? Who am I? Who's this? Who's this guy that nobody's ever seen his face before showing up in this thing? So, yeah. you know, thanks, thanks, Max and George's for for having me. Uh, my name is Eric D'Andrea. It was, you know, I'm going to blame Max that it was spelled wrong on the title slide. Um, yeah, and sorry. We're going to shame him to death for for that. Um, but I, I I I I do a lot of writing around Corcus. I my background is Spring. I was a Spring developer for many many years. I actually skipped the whole Java EE thing. I went right from Swing to Spring and and, and didn't oh. do Java EE. So Corcus, when Corcus kind of came out, it was, you know, I kind of draw a lot of parallels to, to Spring, you know, as a, as a committer and a contributor to some of the Spring stuff. It's like, oh, this, this looks familiar because it kind of works similar or it works completely different than something I'm familiar with. You know, we always talk about and try to relate things, new things to old things that we know. So, you know, that, that's kind of my background and we've got a new book about it as well. So that's kind of why, why I'm here. Yeah, and just full full disclosure because you know as we we do try and get anyone we can get on this show, but from time to time we also get uh, people from Red Hat, and <laughs> so this you are from Red. I actually are you Red Hat developer or like what's your actual title? Like, so my title is is technical marketing manager, which That's as a right. developer, you know, when I put the word marketing in my title, I had some some explaining to do with some of my friends on LinkedIn, like marketing, like, come on. And I don't manage a whole lot of stuff. I don't manage anybody either. I mean, I manage no. programs and whatnot. So, <laughs> but I like to call it like developer advocate is, is yeah. what I like to say. Uh, I said like, um, but I know Eric. So for those who don't know uh, Eric, uh, you, you write a lot of good content and you also one of those who often gives us questions that are hard to answer. Or like, why is this not like this? Or this should be like this. And you're like, okay. Yeah, he's opened up a lot of <laughs> issues on GitHub. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so even though you say you have you're not known, then you at least had a lot of influence on on what we've been doing on. And I can see we have the first comment on uh, the stream today. So just remind everyone, like we're talking here, and Eric is going to show us some stuff from his book uh, that he'd written uh, about Spring for developers. And if you have any questions in any of that topic about spring i'm sure there will be someone uh, you know please please ask them and if if you for some reason don't have a spring ask them too but maybe we don't ask them here but the idea is you'll 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 disturb uh, eric and uh, get, get him to answer well we, we might help him <laughs> so yeah senator eric uh so yeah i actually i didn't know you were like from spring to swing to spring that's uh yeah swing to spring yeah <clears throat> I, I did i actually did a lot of swing training in the back in the good old days how about swing with spring? Yeah, so like, like when yeah. I was ending my spring days, the spring was just kind of coming out, and I, you know, I read a little bit about it. I was like, you know, how didn't really kind of get it. Um, 
but then I moved to, I switched organizations, moved to a different organization that was, you know, full in on spring and had been for a long time. And that was, that was it. I did, I sprinkled a little bit of Java EE with like EJB stuff, like way back when you had to use the EJBC compiler and XML and all that stuff. But all the stuff in between that and where we are now, I, I skipped it all completely. <laughs> oh, someone says swing was love these days. Yeah. Yeah. I still it see it out there too. Yeah. You know, when I when I put, picked up Groovy, so I picked up Groovy, you know, a little bit into my career and I, I did some grails and whatnot. And when I learned the the Groovy DSL on top of Swing, I was like, oh my God, why didn't I know this five years ago? Because oh, it like eliminated all that boilerplate. You know, you you know, we talk about people, you know, if you have a Java class that's got like ten thousand lines of code in it, it's probably a smell that something bad is going on in there. But with Swing, it's just okay. It's ten thousand lines of code because every line is a a setter for some property, or you know, you've got action yeah. listeners that each time you want to do something, it's like ten million lines of boilerplate code that you've got to write just to get to to the meat of things. And when the, the groovy DSL for Swing came out, I was like, oh my god, this is this is awesome. Cool. But anyway, that feels like a lifetime ago. Yeah. Okay. So, what's your book? Yeah, do you want to throw it up on the screen there? Oh, sorry, yes. Yeah, we're waiting on you to kick the show off, man. Yeah, sorry. I'll be back. Yeah, so we've got this this new book, and a lot of it is tailored to, you know, there's there's a ton of resources out there in Quarkus, right? And when I was play, starting to play around with it when it first came out, like I, I mentioned earlier, it was every time you learn something new, you're always relating it in a good, bad, or indifferent way to stuff that you already know so that, you know, you kind of you're, you wrap your brain around it a little bit. And when I was starting to to learn, coming from someone who's really familiar with Spring, and I've committed a bunch of stuff, you know, not recently, but you know, a few years ago, I did some stuff in Spring Security and Spring Boot and whatnot. Mm -hmm. There's a ton of guides, but not a lot of hey, I'm familiar with this concept. You know, how would I do it here? And not just how would I do it, is why should I do it? You know, why is it better, worse, or or whatever? You know, why is it faster? So we we took this road of how, let's take some of the patterns or things that spring developers are familiar with, you know, concepts or conventions, because everything in spring is convention driven. Let's take some of these concepts and conventions and just show how they map to Quarkus through like, through example. So we'll pick a use case, we'll implement it in spring. And in some cases we have to implement it twice in spring because you've got both spring MVC and spring web flux or, you know, reactive, non-reactive, and then show how we would do it in Quarkus or, you know, Kafka and whatnot. So we, we talked about things like, like, why was, why did we decide to do Quarkus in the first place? Like what, what challenges were out there that led to introducing Quarkus? It wasn't like just some people out on the internet decided to, Hey, we need a new Java framework, you know, just because there, there were reasons for it. And then going through the getting started experience, you know, Anybody who's done anything with Spring, you know, knows what the Spring initializer is, knows how to start there, knows what starters are and all that kind of stuff. So kind of explaining extensions, how extensions work, how Code Quarkus works, all that kind of stuff. Looking at, you know, building REST applications, um, exception handling, and every example is fully tested. So I've, I've found in some places, and even out in the internet, and it's not just in the, in the Quarkus docs, but there's a ton of like hello world and getting started, but not a whole lot of, Oh, how do I test the stuff that I built? And I'm a huge test driven development person. I always write tests. I write tons of tests um, for everything that I do. So showing, okay, if you're familiar with, this is how you would test something in spray and this is how you would test it in Quarkus. So we talk yeah. about rest persistence, event driven Kafka, K native, and then, you know, containers, cloud configuration, Kubernetes and whatnot. So, so it's a password compliant book. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there are no passwords in here. Um, so I, I ha do have to give some kudos. I wasn't no, the only buzzword, author. not password. Buzzword. Uh, I, said, I, said password. Uh, I thought you said password. Yeah, there's no passwords in no, there no. either. <laughs> no, but password. But yeah. there's full of it's full of buzzwords. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So yeah. I do have to give some kudos to. I wasn't the only author. I did. There's six chapters. I did the first four. Uh, Daniel O, one of my team members wrote the event driven chapter and then Charles Mouillard who George's, I think you know him pretty well, right? Well, he's my manager, so I yeah. better know him. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he wrote the cloud chapter, but what was kind of cool is there was, we actually reached out to someone outside of Red Hat for the, the forward. So we got, um, 
Martin Verberg from Microsoft to to write a really good forward and just kind of one of the diabolical developer, the diabolical self-proclaimed, right? Self-proclaimed diabolical developer. But he seriously, he runs the the Java group over at Microsoft. Um, He steers the Eclipse Adoptium project that's out there. And they they were one of the early adopters of Quarkus. They they run Quarkus. So if you go to the Eclipse Adoptium site, that's all driven or part of it is driven by by Quarkus. I don't want to misspeak. Um, but really, this this quote that he had in there is is awesome. You know, it's kind of one of those times where, as a Java developer, kind of you, you've been heads down, you know, just doing what you've been doing for so long. There's all this new stuff that's out there. Maybe it's time to to kind of poke your head up out of the out of the the grass or or whatever, and and look around and you know take stock of what's what's going on out there in the landscape. And so that was really cool. cool. And I actually think that we have a user story coming from them on how oh, they do? use it. So, yeah, <clears> it's excellent. Coming, so. excellent. Yeah, I saw uh, they, they had opened a, an issue or two on Rust Easy Reactive and they actually fixed it themselves, too. So that was awesome. Awesome. Yeah. You don't have to do anything soon. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Book itself. You know, I, I talked about the, you know, the history, some of the history, some of the challenges, you know, you know, where Spring fit into those challenges and, you know, for, for solving you know, problems, it was very innovative in it, you know, in its time. Um, still, you know, arguably one of the, the best frameworks out there. Um, how to get started, talked a lot about extensions. You know, we do have, of course, does have those Spring compatibility extensions. The book doesn't really focus on that. There's like a section on it that says, yeah, they're, they're kind of there. But, you know, you guys probably promote as well. That's If you're going to build something from scratch, it's probably not what you're going to use to to build your application, right? It's more for, hey, I've got these Spring things. How do I start to migrate, or you know, how do I get familiar? If I'm familiar with Spring, um, how do how do I do that kind of stuff? So we don't we don't spend a whole lot of time. And, and the whole I know that people are probably begging to ask the question about Spring Native, and I was going to kind of dance around it a little bit, but don't really talk about it in in the book. In the book, you mean? Okay. Yeah, in the book. It's it. All right, I, so I, I, go ahead. Oh. Uh, uh, no, no, I was just going to ask, like, so you're saying you're not so much using the spring uh, compatibility layer, you basically just, so what, what you understand is that the book is more about, hey, here are the spring concepts, mm-hmm. here's how you could do that in Quarkus like, in a similar way or a better way. It's yep. The, yeah. Exactly. All right. All right. Yeah, cool. We throw them out there, we mention them, and I, you know, call them all out and what they map to and, and whatnot, but it's they're, they're, none of the examples and, the, and whatnot talk about it. Um, we talk talk a little bit about dependency injection. We do talk about Quarkus native image because it's you know it's been there for a year, what year and a half now. You know, support for for native image. Oh, it's been there um, from the yeah, way since, way beginning. Yeah, since day one. I mean, yeah, since day one. Talk about you know RSS and, and whatnot, and then getting into some of the testing stuff. What was interesting writing the book. You know, I started writing like back in December, January, and watching Quarkus mature. It, maybe mature is not the right word, but evolve over that time. Like dev services didn't exist when I started writing the book. So like when I wrote the chapters and then dev services came out, I was like, oh man, I got to go back and rewrite some of my chapters be- yeah. or in some of the examples to to, to do some of the stuff. So yeah, yeah, it's funny. The last, yeah, t- in 2.0 with dev services and continuous testing and stuff, like <clears throat> once you start using it, it's like, oh, like this changes everything. Yeah, yeah it does exactly. like everything. I can yeah, literally just don't have to stop anything anymore. So it's, it's yeah. really nice. Yeah, and so the book yeah. talks about that. We did have to cut off. Um, there, there's some newer stuff too, like when we talk about like the reactive testing stuff, like some of the new, like tra- especially around transactions, like the, the whole reactive transactional and the way you can do automatic transaction rollback. That unfortunately didn't make it into the book because, I mean, at some point you've got to cut it off and... and you know, publish it, you know. But... Yeah. Get, for, for those who listen, just one, one, of, the, one of the reasons why I, I, uh, I will say it, Eric's you know, complaints to us to last, <coughs> basically up till you published the book was like, <laughs> man, you add a new great feature. This is unfair. <laughs> is this going to be backported uh, to the previous version? And I, I got it. I got to add it to my book. Uh, yeah. I mean, Georgios was, you, you were just awesome throughout the whole thing. I mean, I, you were like, and I know you're what seven hours ahead, you know, time zone wise from where I am. I'm if on the you're east on coast. the east coast, yeah, then seven. Yeah, and I would like to drop a message in at like two o'clock in the afternoon, and 
you'd answer it. And I totally didn't expect that. Like I figured out ah, he'll catch it in the morning when he, when he gets in, but you know, you are, you are awesome throughout this whole process, like pinging ideas and pushing, you know, ideas out and, you know, helping, you know, move, you know, light a fire under people's butts to get pull requests through and whatnot. <laughs> So Eric, actually, one thing that again, my fault here. Uh, I'm gonna put a link to the book because we now got a question for it. But can you like this book is available as a electronic PDF? Is that yep. like forever or it's like a limited time or what's the? No, nope, it's forever. Yeah. It's free. It's not anything yep. that anybody has to buy. And we we are gonna do printed copies. You know, we they're working on that right now, but we we wanted to at least get it out. Yeah. Right now, it's just PDF. Cool. I think we'll get an, we'll have an EPUB coming out. At, at some point shortly, I I think and I hope. Someone even asked for an audiobook version. I just don't know how that would work. Like dictating <laughs> code to you. Yeah, that's weird. <laughs> yeah, not, not, yeah that, that's gonna be tricky. But yeah. Yeah. So okay. you, you want to throw the screen share back up? Yes. Back? So. Yeah. So the examples. So my my goal is as long as I don't have to touch the the text itself. To keep updating the examples, you know, I, what are you guys doing weekly? So keep updating the examples as long as A, it doesn't break anything, and B, it doesn't involve me having to change any of the text of the book. I'm going to keep the examples up to date. So the, the book content is written against oh, nice. Corcus 2.1.4. There are, like I said, there's some things that came out like in 2.1 that I just couldn't get in, but the code works. So maybe you would have rewritten the code a little bit differently, but for the most part, it, it works. It's fully tested. It's got like 80% test coverage. Um, I have some GitHub actions in there that anytime a code change is, is in there, sure. it, it you know verifies that everything builds and, and whatnot. And all nice. tests run. It's all, so I guess the book is already in ASCII doctor and then you test this, you include the code? Is that how the, it works? No, the book is, so we did it, we published it in-house, so it's not in ASCII doctor. So the, the book ah, contents okay. itself aren't on GitHub. Okay. That's a good, good thing to, to take away, though. Maybe we should yeah. do that. I'd never written a book before, so it was all new to me. Ah, okay. I just, I know, like, you've had for you, like, uh, one of the reasons, like, uh, uh, oh, his name, uh, uh, <coughs> Dan Allen was doing the ASCII Doctor in the early days, was that you, with an ASCII Doctor setup, you can have inclusive source code that are like sections, like tagged from here to here, so you can have the full source code compilable, but only show like a snippet in the, in the book. So, uh, or yeah, that's tough though when you have like call outs in the code, like numbers that refer to bullets after. Like if you change the code, now your bullets and your numbers are all off. Well, ASCII Doctor has, you can put a dot, then it will automate the uh, number, so you don't need Yeah, I learn something new every day. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I see uh, DD, I'm not sure what his name is, but uh, he says, Manning Publication has a good example of audiobooks for programming. I need, I, I'm gonna, I'll be interesting. I've never, I, I, I only read audiobooks. I, I just can't get my head around. Yeah. Like, just thinking just, about it though, like I don't know that like I would comprehend because it's like my it's a visual thing when you look at a block I, of code. It's yeah, I know. I, it's conveniently, exactly. like, it's a uh, it's different. And not, it, not it, only it, that, it it also has to be formatted properly, right? I mean, yeah, the brace has got to be up on the same line, not on the <laughs> next line, right? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. That could be right. a whole conversation on itself. I don't want to go there. <laughs> cool. Yeah, so I did right now the examples are up to 2.2.2. So everything builds with 2.2.2 right now. All right. So, so I'm going to switch over the screen to my IDE here. Go back again. Where is it? Oh, you lost it. There you go. Yeah, so what I thought I'd do is just okay, kind of full walk screen through. just so you can see. Yeah. Yeah, walk through kind of some of the examples and show some of the examples. And to me, like Max and I were playing before we, we came live here, like I've got a 40 or 39 inch widescreen. And right now, like every word is like five inches tall. <laughs> so and I I hate the the white background. I'm a dark mode person. So like right now it's like, oh, like shining on my face here. All this white. Um so like I said, the chapter, the examples are all meant to build the only, it, the, the book isn't set up like start here, like almost like a tutorial. It's not a tutorial thing. It's other than chapter two, chapter two is this is how you would start and, you know, kind of build something from scratch. And so the, the chapter two project that's in the examples repo is what you would end up with at the end of chapter two. But the rest of the, the chapters are more, 
and they don't show all the code snippets from all the projects either. It's like, you know, Spring MVC, Spring Webflux, and Quark is how you would build a, you know, resource class or a controller um, kind of thing. So, but we do have, we do touch on, um, so like in chapter four, when we talk about persistence, you know, we talk about panache, and then we even showcase the differences between active record and the repository pattern. Um, people that are familiar with Spring will probably recognize the repository pattern and, you know, opinion here, you know, disclaimer, my opinion, I, I find that that's the, the my favorite um, pattern as well. I'm not a big fan of the active record pattern. We, we could have a whole conversation about that as well, but. A little less stiff here, but yeah. But yeah, so <laughs> show, show the code. Anyways. Yeah, yeah. So let, let's talk about, um, so let's talk about, we've got here, I'll pull up. Um, so we've got like spring data, we've got spring data, we got spring data JPA and you, Corpus Panache. And then on the reactive side, we've got spring data R2DBC and the Panache reactive I, stuff. Are, are you showing? showing? Oh, there oh, you go. There's, yeah. How, it was, oh, it does, it was it's weird. Up. It doesn't show the like the pop up, like the IntelliJ pop up. It's weird. Ah, uh, <laughs> yes. Got it. Like when I hover over something, it doesn't say, so, so, yeah, you don't see talk, the hover talk, on the screen. Talk, Talking about swing, that that's why. Swing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Actually, I think IntelliJ is Java FX. No, it's not. No, it's no not. it has its own, isn't it? Doesn't it? No, I think it, no, because I I was helping somebody out with the migration toolkit plugin, and it's the stack. I got a big juicy stack trace that was based with Java FX. I'll be very surprised. That could be Java FX in it. I'm not sure. Yeah, it, they could have their own. I, I mean, I don't want to yeah. speculate, but it, I saw Java FX in the stack trace. Right. So what we got here, so we've got, so if we look at kind of the spring, I'm going to move them side by side here, like the spring stuff and then the, the Quarka stuff. If you look at them side by side, you can kind of, and hang on. You can kind of see that they're very, you know, we're just trying to deal with deal with screen real estate here. <laughs> it's it's very very similar, right? I mean, if you talk about like Spring Data JPA and even Spring Data R R two DBC, I mean, by change between these classes, really the only difference is, you know, the interface that you're extending over here, and then the R two DBC returns mono, whereas the JPA one returns optional. So the only major difference are the are the reactive types. The, the main difference, though, between like R2DBC and the Panache Reactive stuff, the Spring Data JPA you know, is an abstraction that sits on top of Hibernate, whereas the Spring Data R2DBC sits on top of the R2DBC project, which then uses the just the Spring Data abstraction for persistence. So what that means is if you look at the, the, the actual entities themselves, there's no, you know, whereas Spring uh, Panache Reactive uses Hibernate Reactive under the covers, which is a, a full-fledged ORM solution, you know, pulling in from Java Persistence and whatnot. The the Spring, when you get into R2 DBC, you're kind of dropping down into Spring-specific stuff. That, that that was my experience. And I hadn't played with R2 DBC before I, I wrote this. So this was kind of my, you know, one of my big observations here when I started looking at this. So you don't have support for any of the JPA annotations with uh, R2 DBC? No, because it's not a J. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, I, I... It's not JPA when either is Hibernate Reactive, but it doesn't. You can't reuse any of the the JPA mm -hmm. annotations. It, it goes down the the Spring Data Commons, like you're starting to use Spring Data Commons. So even like table generation, there, there isn't an annotation for that right now. You've got to go build a, a class, and, and maybe someone will correct me if I'm wrong. Maybe I just don't. You know, I'm I'm too new with, with this, but um, but like generate value, generated value and whatnot, just there, it just doesn't exist. You've right. got to create like an ID generator class, kind of like you can do with with JPA too. Supports like a, a custom ID generator. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, so I, I found that kind of kind of interesting when I started playing. And even if you look at the Spring site and go to the Spring Data R two DBC site, it even calls out that it's not a full fledged ORM. It doesn't support like caching or right behind or any of those kinds of features. Right. <coughs> so all the stuff we've been using for fifteen years, it's not there. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas like 
when you start looking at the difference between reactive and and blocking in uh, Quarkus, I mean, the, the class, if you look at the like the the entity class is is identical. Like there's no change yeah. in the class. Yeah, it's the same, same, same. It's the same class. And it's the same in the in the spring the spring data JPA. The the class is identical between the three examples. But then when Actually, you yeah, in... the, this is something that like I obviously knew it, but um so, yeah, I never realized this this difference between um moving to reactive uh, spring versus Quarkus. That even at this level uh, with Quarkus moving to reactive is like so much easier, right? You, you don't have to change everything. Well, with if you're moving from Spring Data JPA to Spring Data R two DBC, it seems like you have to do a lot of work. Yeah, there's some there's some work you got to do here. So like even like I said, the entity class itself, even I've got a pretty simple example, is identical across mm -hmm. Panache reactive, Panache you know regular or you know Hibernate reactive, Hibernate in Spring Data JPA. It's like the exact same class. It, it's like a, it literally is a copy of each other. Mm -hmm. But then it changes when you get into the the R two DBC. But then from there, it's it's pretty you know the the conventions are are very very similar. Right. Yeah. The difference is, and, and I kind of pointed this out in the book too, is when you get to your front end, like your REST layer, you've kind of got to make a choice before you've written a line <laughs> of code. Am I going reactive or am I not? Whereas, and I didn't even get to touch on this in the book because I had to cut, you know, freeze everything is, you know, um, everything in here uses REST easy reactive. And so your whole, the whole with Quarkus 2.2, you don't even need to tell it anymore. It just knows and understands the, you know, blocking versus not blocking. So let me let me get right. some examples up here, and we can kind of compare and, and contrast here. Yeah. So I think um, to 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 emphasize that for for people who who don't know perhaps what the spring solution is like. So uh, we've did, we've mentioned Rust Easy Reactive here plenty of times, and with Rust Easy Reactive, you can add in the same application do blocking and non blocking even on the same class it doesn't matter rest easy reactive is smart enough to figure all that stuff out in contrast with spring you before you even start you have to choose spring web versus spring um react spring what's called web flux right yep yep <clears throat> yeah and that's a that to me yeah that sounds pretty a pretty big choice you have to make from from the get-go yeah let me pull this up here Active record. I'm pulling up all the examples here. Uh, and just to make clear for people, so you're trying to put you put in the spring on the right and uh, spring on the spring right, on the left. spring on the right, corcus on the left. That's how it goes. So here I've got spring data JPA on the right and panache repository pattern on the left. And you see, I mean, when even when you get into the resource layer, it's pretty. Simple, and I'm using REST Easy Reactive under the cover. So, like one question I've gotten before is, well, you know, with Spring, I've got to make a choice, Spring MVC or Spring Web Flux. It seems I have to make that same choice with Quarkus between REST Easy and REST Easy Reactive. And the answer is no. Like, it's just a different implementation of the JAXRS spec. It doesn't mean your application has to be reactive. And in this case, this is fully blocking, right? But it's using REST Easy Reactive under the covers. So, like what I was starting to mention, if this was built on this was originally built on 2.1 when the book was published. So with 2.2, if I were to write the book now, I would eliminate this blocking annotation because Quarkus at build time would figure it out based on the method signatures. So my method signature returns a you know a non-reactive type. This is a blocking method. Exactly. Yeah. Would move it to a worker thread. Yeah. Yeah. That so that we, one annotation is the reason why we we made that <laughs> that change. Yeah. So yeah, yeah but I it's know, a good. I, it's, Oh yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I just say it's a good point. I, I as I actually haven't realized yet, but like you can still use REST Easy Classic and continue to do so and be happy. But we do recommend people to use move to REST Easy um, REST Easy Reactive. Sorry, you can use REST Easy Classic <laughs> and continue <laughs> to do so. But we want you to use REST Easy Reactive because without changing anything, you get like a 10, 15, 20 percent speed improvement. Uh, but also, we are the stuff we can do, like simplify, that is only in Spring. Uh, so not Spring, only in REST Easy Reactive. Um, but as you say, there's no like if you use a classic, and it should be fairly just an easy move. Um, 
But yeah, I had I hadn't even realized that uh, I always when I've been doing my talks about Quarkus, I always explain this like it's a is we try and offer imperative and but also reactive and uh, in a in in a seamless way. But I didn't actually realize it was it was <laughs> kind of unique. <laughs> but uh, that was that's interesting. Hey, yeah. we learn. That's good. You, yeah, you're so you're... people familiar with Spring MVC, I mean, it's it's very, I mean, learning moving to JaxRS from Spring MVC or even Spring Webflux is it, it it's pretty easy. My, I mean, personal opinion, but and you can just kind of see here. I mean, line for line, it's pretty much the exact same amount of lines. It's probably actually the Spring because there's less imports, but it's all. Um, it's all... Well, actually, even in your in the the Rest Easy Reactive code, you're showing you. In Quarkus, you don't even need the produces um, you have there. Yeah. Because, well, except for maybe for the response one, uh, the rest you don't need them because we're we can figure out that it's actually JSON. Yeah. Yeah, and I know you don't need like path param either. I'm I'm an explicit yeah. person. I like to put it anyway, but more so I put it in here just so it's you see it over here, you see it over here. It just kind of sinks in your head. Mm -hmm. Nothing is just mm -hmm. nothing is magic that's just kind of happening under the covers. At least in this class. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, as you as you pointed out, it, it's almost the same. The the annotations are like they have different names and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes you'll need a couple annotations instead of one for one case or the other, but it's almost a one to one mapping, right? Yep. Yep. It's 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 pretty close. I mean, the, all the magic. I mean, what you're doing in the method is you know pretty much the same. It's more you know how do you drive an HTTP mm -hmm. request down to this method. And that's the only difference. Spring puts everything in one annotation, whereas JaxRS has it separated. But that's that's really the main difference here. Right. So, and then similar, if we go over to like the Panache reactive stuff, the really the only, it, it, it's very similar. You've got flux and monos on the right, and then you've got unis and multis on the, on the left. But the JaxRS part of it is the same, right? Because it's mm -hmm. implementing the same use case. It's just here you're you're working with Project Reactor on the right and you know Mutiny on the left. Mm -hmm. But what gets really interesting is when you actually want to go run it. So let me move this little thing out of the out of the way here. <laughs> so if I want to do the like the let's let's do the reactive side. Like if I want to run this, okay, I've got to go first. I got to go start up a database, right? So let's start doing, up. So I'm using a Spring example. Yep. Okay. Yep. So I'm doing the yep. Spring example, the Spring R two DBC. So I'll kick off a database. Once that's up, I already did compiled everything, so I don't have to. We don't have to sit and wait for for everything to run. But like, even if I just wanted to do, you know, Spring Boot run. It's gonna start up. Um, ba -dum, ba -dum. All right, three point six seconds, and then let's hit it. I use HTTP. HTTP. Do people say HTTP pi or HTTP IE? I don't know what people say. I think yeah, I've seen talks where people refer to it as HTTP HTTP pi. HTTP pi. So, yeah. Yes. And so we got a couple things back, you know, in the way, you know, people are familiar with how REST works, you know, and do some stuff. But what's kind of interesting is if I, you know, then look at R, although I don't want to look at RSS when I'm launching it from Maven because you've got all that Maven crap mm -hmm. in there. Mm -hmm. um, we can look at RSS when we start it up. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. So, but if I do like a Java dash jar target. I'm running Java 11 is the the G, the JVM here. So, you know, 6.2 seconds. Again, I'm on a Mac with 16 gigs of RAM. So if you're running Linux, things might be a little different. But I can hit the same examples. Two, for, okay. For starting up just a basic thing, okay. So if I look at RSS, I gotta find it. PSRSS probably. Yeah, I don't know why it doesn't. It, um, uh, 
I gotta find it. I don't know why PSF. Oops. Oh, I don't know what the JVM calls it. I'm gonna find it. Why can't I find it? Is it... Oh, here it is. Snapshot. <laughs> Oops, you didn't see that, right? <laughs> Typo. <laughs> So four fourteen, four hundred fourteen megs. Four hundred fourteen megs, for four hundred fourteen. And you only did like what two requests, right? Two. Yeah, I only did two requests. Four hundred fourteen megs. Wow. <laughs> wow. <clears throat> so I can. I'm so assuming... then I can. I can kill the database, and if I go, oh, sorry, you talk while I type. Yeah, I'm hoping we're going to do better. <laughs> I'll go to the reactive one. So first we'll do you know maybe even quicker dev. So you notice I killed I killed the database, right? I killed the, the Docker database. Yeah. So this is one of the things like as I was writing, this whole dev services thing came into play. Mm -hmm. And so I had to basically rewrite half of my chapter. Yeah, so for yeah, those now, for, yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, I, I was just gonna say for those who don't know, dev service is a new thing you have in two oh. Well, well, I think we had it 113 as well. Oh, 113, yeah. yeah. 113. So basically it says, if you, if you don't configure your database, we will start one for you uh, if you're running dev mode. That means yeah, like, and these... what, what, what Eric's doing now is like it will start up automatically and somehow fail. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's what happened, yeah. <laughs> um, that's interesting. But unless you start out like Postgres and uh, the, all the different databases, Kafka, Keycloak, Apricuro, what well, else? yeah, we have yeah. a whole bunch these Mon days. Yeah. yeah, yeah, these days we have uh, all the relational databases: MongoDB, Keycloak, Kafka. Uh, then, yeah, there's the Epicurio Registry, yeah. Redis. Uh, uh, and then, uh, I think, yeah, Kumar is yes, using does he use Kafka yes, containers? Does. Yes. yes. So the technology we use behind <laughs> it is test containers, and you might go like, "Why don't Why don't we just use test containers?" Well. Because we can actually, we don't, we don't have to use test containers. For example, if you use H2, we will just run H2 for you. Exactly. Um, yeah. Same for we could do the same for Keycloak potentially. Yeah. Um, so we can we can optimize. And the other thing is that if you use test containers somewhere else, well, by the way, test containers is awesome. Like, do use it anytime you can get to it. But absolutely. the thing is that we know, like, Quarkus has the configuration, and it, the whole thing about build time versus dev mode, we can. We can auto wire a lot of stuff that, uh, so it just kind of works. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. and not only that, we also use it not only for um, for dev mode, but we also use it for tests, right? <laughs> so you could yes. use either the regular Quarkus test or the Quarkus integration test, and then we we wire mm -hmm. up everything for you. So this will just work, right? You don't have to set any URL or bring the proper dependencies or anything else. That just works. Yep. Yeah. And you notice I'm showing the POM here. There's no test containers dependencies yes, exactly. in the POM. Exactly. Corcus just well, kind of does it under the covers. And so, yep, now my the app is up. Now I've got the same endpoints. Hopefully. I do how long does that app take to start? That's in dev mode right now. So it yeah, took a while because it's got to start the, the database. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, the Docker thing. Yeah. Yeah. So if I stop so, yeah, no that. Yeah, run now, the now I got to start the database again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, then you build Quarkus, yeah. run it. Yeah, so I already I already built it, so I can do. Oh, okay. Java, cool. Java to, yeah, I built everything already. Cook, good, good cooking show, right? You put something in the <laughs> oven, and magically you've got another oven right next to it that has the the thing. And just <laughs> while, while you run that, just for those who 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 might do. It. Grab it. So, so in Dev Quarkus Dev Mode, we can add features to the running app of like we can add all, all kind of things. One of them is this test container or Dev services, um, and other things. But then when you actually compile, all that stuff is gone. So there's it's only you only pay the price in quotes Oops. during development and production. Mm -hmm. There's no overhead, and then your app doesn't <laughs> does not exist. Yeah, what did I do? I did something wrong. Well, the your it seems like your uh, database. I didn't set the data when I started it. Yeah. I didn't set the database. Yeah, 
Marcos. I do this all the time. I even have it in my <laughs> notes for the talk to not do this. But. <laughs> yeah. uh, local host five four three two two. There. So two point nine seconds. Two point nine uh, versus. Did. What was it? Six, five, five or six from the, from the spring one. What did I do wrong here? So wait, you're you started your database, but has anybody created the? the you started you started the I server, know, but did you create the actual database? Yeah. So what I've done that's what I did wrong. I didn't have the slash. So the database I'm using, I created my own database image that has that creates the table and populates it with data, because what oh, okay. I wanted to show is. It's great, like that create and drop and have your app, you know, create the database when your tests run and mm -hmm. then stop and, and stop the schema. But I found in my own experience, the more practical scenario is you're building an application that's already connecting to an existing schema. So yeah. I want it to do validation, right? So okay. I have my, if I look at my application and I'm using YAML in this example, but I'm setting the generation type. Well, actually, Hibernate Reactive doesn't have validation yet. Neither does R2DBC. But in the non-reactive version, I have this set to validate. OK. So that way, when my tests run, if I've fat fingered any of the JPA annotations, my tests will fail, rather than create a schema that's not correct, and then my tests work. OK. Right? So yeah. the, 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 the Docker image has the schema and data already created. Yeah, okay, so I didn't. So I fat fingered the the URL. Yeah. This this should work now. Nothing like getting you under the gun when your demo doesn't work, right? Oh, what the hell did I do? Database DB. What did I do wrong? You... Do I need to put the dash D ahead of it. The quark starts faster, but it doesn't get. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's gonna be in front. Otherwise, the uh... Those are just okay. arguments to the app. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. System properties have to be before char. No, actually, wait, wait but this isn't, uh, and it, it shouldn't be uppercase. For an environment variable? Yeah. Well, that's not environment variable. It's a system property. If you want an environment variable, you have to put it before Java and take away the minus D. But anyway, it might, it still might work. Not sure. Yeah, because we're, we're not native image, so I don't have to export it. No, I, okay. So t take the take what you have, the minus D thing. That, yeah, that's, that should be good. My database is running, right? Yeah. Okay. There we go. Hey, there, there we go. go. There we go. Okay, hey, so how, everybody clap your hands. How long did it take to start? Uh, <laughs> it took 3.4 seconds. 3.4 versus 6 or something like that. So the reasons why it didn't work was just because the URL wasn't being picked up. <laughs> yeah, so, I, I didn't have a URL. So now we're at 200 RSS, 208. Versus roughly. 440, right? Versus wow. 440. Wow. So now is the interesting part. I already built the native image, right? And again, I'm on a Mac, not on Linux here. So I could do export. 208. What is it? How big is your app? Not that big. But... Localhost. I four three two. Roots. You want to remove that export in front. Oh, yeah, I got to do a... No, I have to export it. I just got to put a... Oh, yeah, that works too. <laughs> so now we're up in you know, 194 milliseconds. Answer something that doesn't exist. Request. You ask for something that doesn't exist, you get a 404, right? Not a 200 with an empty payload. We can we could have a whole nother conversation about that. 
right? Flip. RSS were at about 30, 33. Mm -hmm. All right, so from 400 something to 200 something to then 33. So good okay. savings. Yeah. And again, I didn't touch Spring Native really at all because it's it's beta. It's, you know, sure. it is what it is. I, I'm not going to, you know, comment on where it is or where it's going or anything like that. But I, you know, it's just when you're writing something and publishing something, you're not going to, you know, work around something that does that you don't know where it's going to go yet. So, sure. Yeah. So, that's, that's cool. All cool. So, even the JVM mode, that's, yeah, <coughs> that's a significant difference. Yeah. What gets even cooler is now when we start talking about like event driven and Kafka and whatnot. Because up until like React, not reactive, until like the repository and the, the persistent stuff, it's pretty, when you look at the two code bases side by side, it's pretty almost one for one. Like it's, okay, this, it almost looks exactly the same. It, but when you start getting into things like Kafka and event driven and, you know, functions as a service, it really starts to diverge and the testing really starts to diverge. Right. Yeah. I didn't show any of the tests here. I can go into that if you, if you want to look at them, but you know, the, the testing aspect is diverges a little bit as well with both of these frameworks, you know, spring has its own Corcus uses, you know, for at least on the rest layer uses uh, rest assured and then has, you know, they, they both based on J unit five and Makito and all that kind of stuff. So there's the pattern is exactly the same. Like maybe it just makes sense if I, if I show it, like here's the the spring test uh, uh, Dom is saying spring native is a terrible state it takes eons to build mm -hmm. so I'm not sure if you compared it to Quarkus because it's also slow for us yeah but so I do know a... that they, that they have more classes on the class bar so therefore things will take longer oh yeah, yeah. tons more no no question yeah. about it yeah. yeah, so I've got now I've got Corcus on the right and I've got Spring on the left, and this is the the non-reactive one. But what's interesting is in Corcus, whether I'm building reactive or not, the test is exactly the same. The only difference is you know because in the return types, the mocking is instead of returning lists, you're returning unis. But the the meat of your test is exactly the same in both reactive and non-reactive. So if I bring up the same test in reactive and look at these side by side. The test specification itself is identical. Mm -hmm. It's just you know the, what, what you're returning is is a different item, but the verification at the end is is exactly the same. And then even when you go into Spring, the the mocking is the same, but the meat of the test is is very different. If we look at the the reactive side, huh? I didn't know this one at all. That's interesting. If you look at the reactive side, the mocking is the same, but you know, because Spring Webflux uses a completely different test framework than Spring MVC mm -hmm. does. So the test is is different, but the mocking is the same. Right. How, couldn't you use like the 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 Webflux test client with MVC or is that not does that not work? You probably could. You'd have to bring in like the Spring Webflux dependency into your test scope and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And you probably could wire it the What's cool about Webflux is when you're using, you know, Spring the starter for Webflux, it auto configures the the web test client for you. So you'd probably have yeah. to do some some magic and whatnot to maybe just mm -hmm. throwing this annotation on your test would be enough with as long as you had the dependency. I'm okay. not sure. I haven't played with it. But the other cool thing is like you said with dev dev services, especially in the reactive space, there's no like the database just, is just kind of there because dev services yeah, yeah. Will start it for me. But here I had to build a um, using test containers directly. So the dependency mm -hmm. list for the Webflux version actually uses test containers directly because I need to instruct it when R2DBC because R2DBC and test containers doesn't have like a, one of those magic URLs that you can use. I actually have to bootstrap right. test containers myself. Right. Oh yeah. And that's another good point that we didn't mention is that uh, with dev services, uh, for the relational databases, it works for both the reactive and non-reactive. Well, same for Mongo and like Redis. Yeah. Everything, everywhere we have a reactive client and a blocking client, uh, we have dev services for both, right? And you don't have to, <laughs> you don't have to worry about it at all. 
Very cool. Yeah. And so like on the, the non bot so the Spring Data JPA, for example, so the test containers itself has a, um, and where is it here? So test containers itself, when you run your test, oh, I have an application, different application. You know, so that's another thing that Quarkus unifies the all your configuration in a single file. I have a different application YAML in my source test resources here for the Spring. So in Spring Data JPA, you can set the data source URL if you prefix the URL with this TC. Now, th there, there's a reference in the book to the documentation, but Test Containers has a URL you can create to tell it what data source to create. So when you run your test, it'll auto as long as Test Containers is on your class path, it'll automatically bootstrap the database for you using Test Containers. But on hmm. the reactive side, the R2DBC, it doesn't have that. Yeah. At least it didn't when I wrote the, uh, the book. This is this is great. So this is like st eye opening stuff for me as well. I didn't I didn't <laughs> realize these these sorts of differences, right? And this is the kind of thing where you just want things to work uh, without any changes, right? Yep. Yeah, and I know we only got a couple minutes left, but just you know, yeah. kind of diving into some of the the Kafka stuff, like when you so one of the the use case. I, I, I Obviously, a lot of these samples you guys are familiar. They came from a lot of the Quarkus Quick Starts because I, I didn't really feel like inventing my own um, mm -hmm. domain for for my example. It's always better to to steal, beg, and borrow from what someone else has done. <laughs> right? That, that's how we we roll. Um, but getting into some of the Kafka stuff, so like I, I built an example that it has the pop, the producer, and the consumer in the same code base, so you don't have to like bootstrap multiple applications, one to to publish and one to consume. Um, so the in, in chapter five for Kafka, this uses Spring Cloud Stream. So when you start getting into some of these other things like cloud events and uh, not serverless, um, functions as a service and whatnot, now you're getting into like Spring Cloud Functions, Spring Integration, Spring Cloud Stream. One thing I found kind of interesting, and if I go into the Quarkus one first, so here's the Quarkus one, and let me find it. So like the the... The main goal is you generate a random number, right? Every five seconds and drop it on a Kafka topic, right? So you just create a multi, you know, using the small right reactive messaging thing, drop it onto the, the, the topic. And then you've got a consumer that reads it in and then does some stuff to it in this, you know, pretty simple here, but, you know, does some stuff. And then rather than publishing it back to another Kafka topic, sends it to an in-memory stream using the Vertex event bus. And then there's a REST endpoint, which serves that as a service end event. So you can get a browser client or, you know, curl or whatever that. So as your publisher is publishing events, it's flowing through Kafka, doing some messaging and then flowing through an in-memory channel into, um, into a service end event. When I built that in spring, where is it here? Spring. What? I was just saying, if you're gonna make Clement happy in a few seconds. Yeah. So here, you so this uses Spring Cloud Stream, which is based on Spring Cloud Function. So there's there's a lot. You know, we could have a whole conversation about is it better to create separate classes or is it better just to create bean? You know, a single bean that returns a um, you know a function or whatnot. I I always err on. I want to create if it's a if it's something that does something, it should be isolated in its own thing. One, because you want separation, right? Everything should do one thing and should do that one thing well, but it also makes it much easier to test. Like I can just create, I don't even need Spring to test this class. I can just create an instance of it, right? Because it's a class. So in any event, it implements a supplier with you know Java util function supplier and returns integers. So this does the same thing where it's every five seconds, it's generating a random number, publishing it to Kafka in the, all the configuration is done in the, in the configuration file. And so that's a bean when I have, I consume it, you know, I'm consuming you know, as a consumer. Um, but what I found interesting and maybe, you know, I, I reached out to a few people and I couldn't figure out how to do is how do I take that and then send that to an in-memory channel? And if you read the spring integration and the spring cloud stream documentation, they talk about this it's on the reactive side, I'm specifically talking this emitter processor thing, and I don't have the documentation in front of me, but if you actually Google search what that emitter processor thing is, it actually comes from Project Reactor, and it's actually deprecated. So I had I actually built my own class, which wraps, so Project Reactor has this thing called syncs, which is essentially an in-memory channel. And there's different kinds of syncs, you know, many, you know, with many subscribers or one subscriber or whatever. But 
I basically built yeah. this thing that wraps because I didn't want to expose Reactor up into my business logic. So I built this thing and I you know fully documented it and whatnot, but essentially emitting values into a sink, you know, as I'm accepting things, I'm emitting them into the sink, but the sink is meant that if it doesn't have any subscribers, it just drops it. So it's not like it's queuing up this huge queue in memory. It won't start queuing anything unless it's just a subscriber. And then in the controller, I can expose that as a server sending event because it, the sync exposes a publisher. The sync itself is a, is a publisher. But I just found it interesting that since Spring Cloud Stream is based on Spring integration, that there seem to be Spring integration objects for you know channels because that's what it's built for. But And maybe if someone wants to go figure this out on my own, I spent hours and hours and hours trying to figure this out, you know, talking to some of the Spring Cloud Stream folks and whatnot, but I, I couldn't figure out a better way to do it. So I'll accept if anybody wants to accept that challenge, I'm totally open to to backtracking on what I've just said. <laughs> uh, so Salvatore says he enjoyed the book and today is the live stream. I wanted to ask about the <coughs> gateway pattern in particular to an equivalent to the Spring Cloud Gateway Library. Oh wow. yeah, Spring Cloud <laughs> Gateway was on our original table of contents, but we axed it based on time so next version you know advanced topics of the next book <laughs> got it okay <clears throat> but i don't know you if you guys want to talk about the gateway pattern and what's there in corcus so you can certainly add color to that if you want well yeah okay so we don't have a end-to-end -end solution like spring cloud gateway right so I, I admit spring cloud gateway i like it it it, it definitely serves like uh plenty of use cases i think it's really interesting uh, so you could build the same thing with Quarkus and Vertex, and my guess is it'll perform a lot better. But you have to build it yourself. That, that's the magic of Spring Cloud Gateway, right? You just write a couple of beans or some YAML, and everything just falls into place. Uh, we don't have that um, excellent experience at the moment. Uh, well, who knows? Clement, Clement was working on it, right? Uh, not Clement. Uh, oh, forgot uh, Michael. No, Mike Miko was working on something related, but okay. not the same. Not not the same thing. Okay. Not the same. It, it's Got all it. connected, though. Yeah, it, you you yeah. do have the basic idea. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, yeah we don't so, have time to show the testing here, but you know the same kind of thing with dev services. You know, I'd have to my tests have to manually bootstrap Kafka, and what I did is I actually built a. Um, I didn't build so this this was written by Daniel O, but we built a, a Docker Compose to essentially stand up the Kafka infrastructure. So with the spring version before your test, you'd have to manually, you know, you would build the test containers that bootstrap the Docker compose so that when the tests ran, it would bootstrap Kafka. Whereas with Quarkus, that's another thing when dev services for Kafka came along, I had to rewrite part of the chapter is, Oh, well, I don't have to do that anymore. It's less stuff I have to do. So last update hot off the press. I just talked to Clement. And he told me that we have big plans uh, for something like Spring Cloud <laughs> Gateway. So st stay tuned. Yeah, that's what, that's what I thought. That was something coming. So, yeah. All right. But, uh, Eric, we are, are running out of time. Do you have one last comment you want to do about your book besides go read it? Or Yeah, yeah. Go go read it and reach out to me. You know, questions, concerns. Because it's the first book. I've never written anything more than an article before. So, it was an interesting process, especially while you're trying to do your day job. But <laughs> awesome, <clears throat> cool. No, but Eric, thank you for coming and thank you for writing the uh, the book. And uh, yeah, I should go read. The, I've I've seen parts of it. I haven't read the last one, so I'm gonna go try it now. Terrible, terrible. Oh. <laughs> yeah, sorry, sorry. Thank you very much, Eric, both for the book and yeah. for being here today. It was really yeah. eye opening. Thanks a lot. Yeah, no, I learned a few things. I didn't realize that. We did. So that was good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. We'll go.